Hey guys, I'm Sai, and welcome to Ace Podcast Nation. On the channel, we've got podcasts, series, and content on all sorts of subjects from football, mental health, music, films, TV, conspiracy theories, MMA, boxing, so many that I, uh, I struggle to list them all off. Uh, every Monday, we have a live football show with former Middlesbrough and Cardiff City striker Andy Campbell, uh, which is live 7.30 on Facebook, Periscope, and YouTube. Every Monday evening, we talk generally talk about the championship uh, games and the biggest stories in the football world. However, due to the fact that there is no football at the moment, we talk in uh, a bit of everything. A bit of Premier League, a bit of Championship, a bit of Lower Leagues. We're talking about where to go with the season in the, in a, in amidst all this trouble with the pandemic, as well as where we also review some some classic football matches, as well as answer the questions from the live chat. Uh, every Wednesday, we have the Danny Batten MMA show, uh, where myself and former Cage Warriors champion Danny Batten go through, uh, well, we normally cover current boxing and MMA, but obviously with the same again, there's no current shows. So we are currently reviewing classic uh, boxing and classic MMA fights from over the years, which is a lot of fun. And I, I get the distinct impression that Danny prefers covering old MMA to current MMA, but uh, that's just the impression I get. We also have lots and lots of other series, Unscripted and Uncensored, where uh, you, the people, get to select the questions for the guests. And, uh, of course, today's episode is episode number four in my story. My story, we take our guests through their career as they share memories and anecdotes along the way. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, writer, actor, broadcaster, documentary filmmaker, and other uh, all sorts of other uh, other jobs. He is uh, best known for playing Lofty in EastEnders, but has been involved in BBC radio show uh, Fight and Talk, as well as making documentary films for BT Sport. And this uh, Mr. Tom Watts. Welcome, my friend. How are you? How are you, Simon? I'm well. I'm well. I'm, I'm really, I've got to say, I'm very excited to have you on the show. I am, um, <laughs> obviously... That's a I, off, mate. Don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, yeah yeah because uh, like you know obviously doing a podcast of all sorts of subjects i'm always looking for you know for guests to to speak to people who've got interesting stories people who are you know footballers and actors musicians whatever it may be i'm always looking mm. for guests um and as you can imagine sometimes i'll message people and i don't hear back from them which is understandable you know they're, they're very busy and um my wife would tell you, as soon as uh, I saw that reply from yourself uh, after I'd messaged you, I was very excited because it's just, I wasn't really expecting a reply. So uh, I thank you for that, just to start mm -hmm. with. Um, so how are you finding uh, the current world we're living in at the moment? It's a bit strange. Yeah, I, I mean, as it happens, I've got quite a lot of work on that involves sitting in front of the computer. I did just get finished on a documentary series sort of before the shutters came down, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, which, right, and obviously documentary series, that is quite social. You know, you're, you're having to, you know, the people you're doing the film with and then the editor and one thing and another. So, but I kind of got done just as, well, the last filming we did was the Saturday before all football shut down. So, you know, that was, it was lucky really. Um, and we've, we've shot a couple of little, or we haven't shot, but we've got some UGC from people uh, now that they're in lockdown sort of thing. But, um, but now I'm, I'm on with, I'm, I've started working on a new book and I'm, I'm doing quite a bit of work for, uh, I, I do quite a bit for EA sports, you know, on the FIFA game. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> which usually, I, I, I work with the guys come over from Vancouver and I work with them here. But this particular block of work is actually to do with, because um, I, I work on storylines for their, you know, the, the FIFA game has a kind of story mode, like quite a lot. Of yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, I guess. And um, I work on the story with them. Um, and um, that's, that's kind of one thing I've done for a while now for them, but this is different. This is working. There's a lot of kind of text, a lot of script on the game. And it's yeah. just, I think they just decided it was time to sort of knock it in slightly better shape. So I'm working on that at the moment. 
which is um and there's quite a lot of it to be fair so and that's just me and the computer so actually it's all right you know i'm kind of where i live quite nice out in the middle of nowhere i get out for a walk for an hour every day and get the sun on me and so touch wood um i'm i'm doing okay i'm doing okay it's um it, it is weird because everything seems to be about covid19 oh well understandably everything's about covid19 and yet i feel slightly disconnected from it do you know what i mean but i haven't yeah, yeah. Been, i haven't been anywhere but my house for a month but strictly speaking i'm not sure i would have done anyway you, well i would have <laughs> done because I'm, I'm actually the one thing i'm really really missing is the swimming baths i do like the swimming baths um, and uh obviously that's shut down so i can't get there so i have to make do with a walk around the village so that's um it's a really interesting thing straight away you said they're working on the um the ea sports games um obviously you know they're massive yeah yeah so far so fifa but like even you know fifa is one of the biggest games in the world isn't it and i mean obviously (laughs) yourself as a football fan um how did that come about just that seems um quite interesting to be honest, it kind of, I, I'm not 100% sure. I just got kind of directly approached about it. And I think the, the the initial idea, I get the impression the initial idea was they had this idea to do a kind of story. You know, there was this whole Alex Hunter story. Yes. Um, which ran for three years. Um, and then there was another story around street football um, the year after that. Uh, and then there's story elements in, in all of the, in all of the games now, in all the F- FIFA games now. But um, I think really they just wanted someone who would be able to, um, uh, what's the word, just kind of make sure that the story was credible, both in terms of yeah. the general arc of the story, but also in terms of the detail. And although obviously I've never, you know, I'm not a player, I'm not a manager, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a professional journalist, I'm not a, uh, on the board of directors anywhere but I, I kind of have been around football a lot for a long time and so I guess I kind of have a feel for what's true and what isn't and um, you know a certain amount of knowledge and any knowledge that I don't have I know who to ring to check so I think that was where it started but then obviously I write you know I write books so I've got an idea on stories anywhere anyway really so that developed into more rather than just checking what they'd done it became more helping to create the story in the first place which obviously is a lot more interesting indeed yeah that, I, I can imagine that is uh, it's a very like interesting job to do um so yeah i mean if to I be wanna... fair, it's a story like any story i mean you know stories yeah, are sto- a story is a story and a good story is a good story it's it the the what's different is the medium really, which is a computer game, which I hadn't worked in computer games before. So that's you know from that point of view, it was it was interesting. Yeah, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe they're like they're branching stories. I think aren't they where you make a choice yeah, and answer, and it goes off in different directions <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, a lot of that, the general shape of the narrative is is pretty much always the same. It just will vary because obviously you take on you don't have to be what the game tells you alex hunter yes, or cool. the characters are like you can decide what those characters are like what kind of personalities they have and you know and then the game will branch depending on the choices you make about one about the kind of character you are and two about certain decisions that you make in in the course of the story yeah cool i am um... I used to play them a lot. I haven't played uh, FIFA for a, for a few, few years, really, basically because my kids hog any chance <laughs> that I would have of playing any sort of video games these days. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to – we're going to come back to uh, to your writing um, and because I know you've done – you've written, like, books. You've written, obviously, uh, match reports and football-type stuff as mm. well. Um, mm. So if we go – what I'd not like to do with the guests is take them right back to the start. Um, and if you could tell us like a little bit about your kind of your up- upbringing and kind of what that was like and how you got started. Well, I grew up in North London. Uh, my parents were both teachers um, and um, went to school, you know, I'm sort of Holloway around the corner from Arsenal, really. Um, 
kind of born and bred that neck of the woods and um, went to university in Manchester um, and did a degree in drama and then kind of kind of stayed there really stayed in Manchester I had a uh, started a small scale touring theatre company um, that ran for four or five years and then just started freelancing freelancing as an actor really um, and ended up getting um, actually had some good work before it but it, ended up getting cast in EastEnders and I did that for the first three years and that did kind of change things in terms of profile and what have you, you know, and made a lot of a lot of other things possible. Obviously made other acting work possible, but also, you know, I've got, I, I, while I was doing EastEnders, I started a charity football team and, you know, kind of started meeting a lot of people in football and, and that kind of led to starting to write about the game and broadcast about the game and, and gradually that sort of, almost not by any design really but that kind of um started to take up more of my time perhaps than than acting did um and um you know you just kind of I just sort of follow the next thing you know and um i um there's a lot of kind of different stuff i do um but I'll, how i look at it is i probably you know, all the different things I do, Simon, I can think of people who do each individual thing better than I do. What I don't know is anybody else who does all of those things. Yeah, so I keep course. thinking, well, if I do that for a while and then people go and get someone who's better than me and so I move on to the next thing and then I move on to the next thing. <laughs> and then eventually, when I've run out of things, well, the first lot I've forgotten out that I wasn't really all that good, so they give me another go. Um, and so I kind of keep getting away with it, really. <laughs> I um I was uh, amazed uh, that just some of the, not just obviously everyone knows you from EastEnders of course, um, but you also were in a film with uh, I think it's Harrison no Patriot Games Harrison Ford is it? Yeah, Patriot yeah. Games. I mean that was a That's, bit of a uh, kind of one. It was only like a day's work, um, and uh, but still, to be still. Honest, yeah, although. I'll be honest with you, at the time, Arsenal were playing Benfica that night <laughs> in the European Cup after after English clubs got um, admitted back into Europe. And I'd been to the game in Lisbon, which we drew 1-1. Um, and so the home leg to come and you think, oh, this is, you know, is going to be great. And uh, anyway, I did the job. And the job was good, do you know what I mean? I, it, I wasn't acting with Harrison Ford or anything like that. It was just a scene in the film. But it was, you know, it was a good scene and it could easily have been cut and it wasn't cut. And it's about the only scene in the film where someone doesn't get killed. Um, but I did get away in time. They, they got a cab for me and I got to uh, I got to Arsenal just in time to see us get stuffed 3-1 by Benfica in the mm -hmm. second leg. Which was the night I realised just what a good manager Sven Joran Eriksson was, really. Because yeah, he was in charge of Benfica at the time. Ah, right, OK. So you can always rely on football to ruin a perfectly good day, I find. <laughs> The, uh, yeah, yeah, that was um, yeah, that weren't a, that weren't a great night to be fair. <laughs> so, um, just briefly, I wanted to talk about EastEnders. Obviously, I think were you in the show from the very first episode, or did you uh, come in a couple of episodes yeah, from the beginning? Anyway, yeah, yeah, I wasn't in. I don't think I was in episode one, but certainly in episode two. And and I did go back. I did a, a, an episode last year. They had a storyline. You were in it last year. Down. Yeah. And it was great. Do you know what I mean? It was it was really great experience and stuff. But three years, quite a long time. Um, but I think it was it was you know obviously it's it's really good to be in something at the start. Um, and obviously then there were only <coughs> there were only the four channels, cool. so it became kind of you know you you had the possibility for it to become very popular very quickly, which it did, and. Um, you know that was i think i was i was quite lucky really to to be involved with it when i was yeah um did you Great. was there any 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 particular storyline that you were involved with with eastenders which was which sticks out as a favorite oh i'll be honest with you you know simon really i am i'm terrible but i've got um uh you know you've got you've got a hard drive haven't you and then you've got the stuff that you're working on at the moment and I do the stuff I'm working on at the moment and as soon as it's done I just forget it 
Yeah, yeah. So EastEnders is kind of gone. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of, of gone. Um, you know, <clears throat> so no, I wouldn't say there were particularly. You know, we had we had some fun. Had some fun with the charity football team um, as well, the Walford Boys Club. That was brilliant, brilliant time. Um, you know, we'd do the show, but then on Sundays and then midweek evenings during the summer, we'd, we'd go off and play football all these places all over. The, oh, God, we went all over the place mm. playing football. Um, some of the lads from the show, some mates, one or two ringers, you know, it was, it was really fun that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but no, the show itself, I mean, you know, that was... I think particularly at the start, and there wasn't the same kind of pressure on the things. We only we were only doing two episodes a week, so you know, yeah, there, you know, there wasn't the same pressure on storylines. There wasn't the same pressure on turning the show round and stuff. And so, you know, from all sorts of point of view, point, points of view, really, I think it was it was I was lucky to be doing it when I when I was. Cause, you know, the writing was really good. They wrote me a really good character. Um, you know, character who was had funny stuff to do, but had serious stuff to do as well. So it was, it was good. Indeed, and um, just before you did EastEnders, you had um, I think was this your first comedy role? Oh, your first, sorry, your first TV role was the uh, Never the Twain, uh, which was like no, a com- was... comedy TV show. No, I did quite a lot of stuff. No, first thing was um, first what felt like my first big thing because I. I, I, when I was running my own company up in Manchester, I used to go and do a lot of extra work and, you know, the odd line here and there for yeah. uh, Granada Television and Yorkshire Television. Granada, particularly the casting department there, they were big fans of the theatre company I ran. And so they were very kind of supportive. So I could always, I could ring up and say, look, you know, we've got, we've only got shows Thursday, Friday, Saturday this week. Have you got any work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Because obviously we never made any money out of the theatre company, but I could kind of pay the rent doing extra work and and little parts and stuff. And I did end up, um, I did end up getting the lead in a a thing for ITV, kind of a bit later on before EastEnders. Um, see, this is what I mean. I just forget stuff. I can't even remember mm-hmm. what it's called now. It's a thing with a guy called Brian Kant, sort of kids detective series uh, that was really nice it was good actually um but it didn't go to series it was a pilot for a series and it ended up not going to series but i had um yeah I used to do loads of stuff loads of stuff it even some of the stuff even turns up now and again do you know what i mean old mm-hmm. episodes of sherlock holmes from god knows when and stuff like that you know um yeah it's uh, so, it, it, but EastEnders was something different, obviously, in terms of the scale of the thing and the amount of exposure and what have you. Yeah, of course. I think you you must have done a good two two hundred and fifty episodes of EastEnders, and I know you said that you know back then it was only two episodes a week. Like now they do, I think, four or five episodes a week, Ooh, which means yeah. I would imagine yeah. that means they're filming. You know, probably six days a week. That's a lot. Of... Oh yeah, I mean, I went in to do the episode last year. You know, and you think, wow, though they are really, they're really grafting now. I mean, they've really Churn, are churning them out. And you know, not having, <coughs> not having much time to rehearse, having to do episodes out of order. Do you know what I mean? It's hard. It's really hard. I, I, I have to say, I kind of, I really admire the people who, you know, and I, I guess it's the same on the street, isn't it? it you know, you've got to admire just the stamina of people and trying to, and being able to keep at a certain level of quality, despite being under pressure all the time like that. I think yeah. you know, a lot of respect for them. Yeah. You're spot on actually not, you know, not, not just actors, but people of any, uh, you know, any trade when you're doing like 50, 60 hour weeks, you're, you're tired, you're overworked and you've got to, you know, you, you're churning out stuff at that really high quality. It's it's incredible, just the yeah. Like, yeah. perfect word, stamina, uh, to yeah. do it. No, absolutely. Um, you also appeared in one of my favourite all-time TV shows. Um, I think it was only for an episode, which was Boone, um, which is oh, okay. not one for my not one for my younger uh, viewers and listeners. But for me, yeah. like as a kid, I remember my parents would watch it, and I used to love it. Just used to yeah. love 
watched. No, absolutely. No, I do. Re- I I don't remember anything about the episode. <laughs> um, in fact, I don't even remember who who's in it. To be fair, um, I I do I do remember it, but I don't I don't remember. But it's the, um, I remember the guy it. that played Bergerac, and I forget. His, I always forget his name. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, who knows? But why I really remember it, we were shooting in, a lot of it was on a, like a canal just outside Nottingham where people who go up the M1 will know there's, there's like some big old cooling towers as you go up the M1 between Derby and Nottingham. You know, Derby's one side of the motorway, Nottingham's the other. And yeah. If you're going along, you see these huge cooling towers between the motorway and Nottingham. And there's a canal that runs down the bottom of those and a lot of the filming was around then and I remember um because I was uh, I was about to start rehearsals for an outdoor production of Richard the Third and it was it was massive really um in that Richard the Third obviously is you know and it was playing Richard the Third but they were doing both plays they were doing Richard the Third and Henry the Sixth Part Three both of which Richard is in it's massive um, you know, they're like 20 solilo- soliloquies. And I remember all the time when I was shooting that episode of Boone, all I was doing was when I wasn't on camera, I was learning Shakespeare. Line. Jeez. Learning the line Shakespeare. Because we only had like three, four week rehearse on the Shakespeare before doing it. Uh, it was at a castle in Staffordshire, just outside Stafford. And um, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant, brilliant job. Um but I had to learn all the soliloquies really before we started rehearsing because otherwise I would have been, I would have been knackered. I couldn't have. Um, but that's what I'm saying. I learned all those soliloquies. I learned the parts. You know, you, you know, on on a Saturday we used to do, we do both plays back to back. So that's like five hours, five and a half hours on stage, non stop. And it was proper. It was proper. It's outdoors. You know, full armour. Bloody explosions, right. horses, all the, all the, it was brilliant, brilliant job. Um, but so I did all that and literally, uh, you know, learned all the soliloquies, you know, now is the winter of our discontent and all the others. And literally a week after they're gone, I couldn't remember a word of any of them. Do you know what I mean? You just keep Nightmare. it in the front of your brain while you're, um, it's funny, like this documentary series I've just been working on. Obviously, we've done four half hours, and obviously, I've been completely involved with with it, producing it, and what, one thing and another, and working on the edit and stuff. But my work got done, as I say, three and a half weeks or so ago. I got finished with what I needed doing it. Someone phoned me the other day, was asking questions about it, and I went, "Don't remember. It's only three weeks ago. I don't remember. <laughs> you haven't even had to remind me. I, it's, it's mad." But that's, I think that's how, you know, you just have to keep what you're doing in the front of your mind because that's what you need. Yes, that's what you need. Yeah, and everything else just, I'm sure it's in there somewhere, but I don't know where. I wouldn't know how to find it. But Especially, that's why I remember Boone. I remember Boone because I was learning all the Richard III soliloquies. You must have, you must, you must have a, an excellent memory um to, to be able to retain you know i know you say like um you know once you've done it it's gone but like at yeah. the time learning all of that obviously working on boone as well that's a lot of uh you know lines if you like to to remember all at once yeah but i think that's that i mean i think you'd find most actors that's that's yeah. the kind of facility actors tend to have yeah, you know, I've always you know. found it. Yeah, I've always found it interesting. If you can't the remember the, can do the it. line, you're struggling, really. So you know, you need to. Absolutely, yeah. I've um, I've always it's always been something which has baffled me because um, I've never had the best memory. Um, but the, my memory, as of probably the last ten years or so, seems to have really taken a a a turn for the worse. As it seems <laughs> to be, the clo- closer I get to forty, I seem to. Re- re- uh, retain information for a shorter amount of time and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah but someone asked me the other day so i've recorded now about 180 odd podcasts all of which are probably at least 45 minutes to maybe two and a half hours long depending on what type of show they are and someone asked me about um the second episode i 
recorded and they were asking me like a load of questions and details about it because they were doing like a little blog post about it and i was like can i get back to you because i couldn't if if you if you need that information you know here and now i can't even remember who the guest was no you had no chance no, and really. i i felt really bad because i thought well you know that, that i i should remember who the guest was and what we talked about but it's a lot of, it's a lot of conversations with a lot of people mm. to mm. to sift through yeah um, absolutely so yeah you've done um you know you've done some films you've uh, you've done sherlock holmes in 2009 uh you've done like i said patriot games you've done uh lost dogs some big films really um yeah lost dogs wasn't a very big film but it was a it was a good it was i tell you it was done that was a real cheap british movie <coughs> and i'm still quite proud of it it never really got you know it's kind of straight dvd but good film there were some good people in it as well um Ron Moody, Leslie Joseph, there were some good people in it. It was uh, it was really, it was about a couple of guys who um, thought it would be a good idea to kidnap some rich people's dogs. Mm. Um, and uh, I was one of the kidnappers rather than one of the rich people, but we shot it all around um, Bristol and stuff. It was really, yeah, it was really good, really good. A bad guy, a bad guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, does, have you played many bad guys throughout your career? Yeah, well, Richard uh, III is about as bad as it gets. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the bad, the worst of the worst. Yeah. 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 Um, do you prefer um, kind of doing acting work, or would you do rather kind of the documentary films or like radio work or media? You know, work? I don't mind. I just, you know, I'm. Uh, I like it all. I like what I do. You know, and and really, you know. It's not like there's so many million miles apart, really. It, it uses a lot of the same parts of your brain and um, asks for a lot of the same sort of skills. Um, it's different, but there's similarities as well. So, no, I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't ever think, oh, I'd, I'll just do that or I'll just do that, because if I thought that, then I would. And like I say, I think, you know, I like acting, I like making films. I like writing books. I mean, there are probably mm -hmm. people who do all of those things individually better than I do, perhaps okay. because it's all they do. Whereas I like to be able to go from one thing to another. I like to be able to go from a, you know, a documentary series to a book to something else to, you know, I, I like all that. I like the variety. So, yeah. I was going to say writing is something, um, you know, which you've done a lot of. Um, yeah. I believe you you yeah. started off writing. Uh, did you do mass reports and and features for the Observer? Was it the did, Observer? Well, I, yeah, I, I mean, I did write. I wrote plays for the theatre company I, I ran, but then really, um, I did a book about the old North Bank at Arsenal when uh, all the, um, you know, after the Hillsborough report and when they decided that you know terraces were going to have to be pulled down or made all seater and uh, i just thought you know obviously i grew up watching football on terraces and I thought that's to lose that and all the history that goes with that and the whole experience of watching football in that way it, it'd be a shame if you lose it because once it's gone it'll be forgotten so I did do a book called The End, which was really like a kind of, I don't know what you call it, really. It's a bit of a kind of social history of the North Bank at Arsenal because that was the terrace I knew, that was the club I knew. And, um, you know, I talked to supporters, but also talked to players, talked to police, talked to St. John's Ambulance, talked to bloody hot dog sellers, whoever. Do you know what I mean? And the club were very helpful. You know, they gave me access to kind of minutes of board meetings going back to you know, just after the First World War and stuff. And, um, wow. you know, I had all the old programs and stuff. So I just put together this thing and that that did really well, that book. That was really popular. Um, probably not in Cardiff, but it was very popular in North London. Um, and I'm I'm delighted that a lot of people have done books like it since. Do you know what I mean? It, yes, it was, yes um, yeah, definitely. You know, it was the first time really anybody had tried to do... It was basically, it was what you would call oral history. It was, you know... It wasn't what I thought. It wasn't what I said. It was going and interviewing people and getting their memories and ideas and thoughts down on paper. 
And um, yeah, that did okay. And it was off the back of that, really. I got approached by the Observer who said, and they said, oh, would you be interested in maybe doing some match reports? And great, which was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I had a great time doing that. I did that for four or five years. And, you know, generally speaking, I could work in, you know, usually I could kind of work it in around acting work. It, it usually worked okay. I could get to a game on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and the Observer were good if I couldn't get to, you know, if I couldn't be at a game on a Saturday afternoon, then they'd say, fine, we'll ring us when you can. And um, and I guess I was a bit different because I didn't mind which game I went to. I wasn't kind of, obviously, if you're a, you know, a, if journalism, sports writing is what you do, then you want to be at the biggest games. Do you know what I mean? I didn't mind. Yes, I didn't, yeah, of course. Plus what game I went to. It was the whole process of writing about football that I liked. And it was... You know, I think when you when you go and watch your team, when you're a fan, you know, as a supporter, basically I would watch, I would, you know, I would watch, I'd only watch half the game. I'd only watch our players. I wouldn't be bothered about oh, the okay. other lot. They would just the other lot. Do you know what I mean? I was yeah, just yeah. bothered about us. Um, where obviously if you're writing about football, then you need to actually watch a game between 22 players and see how it's going one Absolutely, way or another. Yeah. So, it did. Not only was it a great exercise as a writer, 800 words on the final whistle, but it was also, it did teach me to kind of look at football in a different way, really. Um, and I, I've in, I enjoyed that. I liked that. Um, and because I could go to games that weren't the obvious ones, you know, either lower league games or even, you know, kind of less starry games in the Premier League, um, top division, first division or the Premier League as it became, I could, um, it was more about the stories, less about the game and more about the stories. You know, you wanted to, you know, if you're going to watch, oh, I don't know, you're going to watch Brighton's last game but one at the Goldstone ground, well, then you, you write a bit about why they're having to leave the Goldstone ground. You know what I mean? You, you know. Yeah. Um, if you're, um, you know, if you're going to do a report on Wimbledon, then you're going to write about the weird Norwegian geezer in Wellington Boots who's managing the team. So, you, you know, you could, there, were, there were ways to tell interesting stories. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and you've written, uh, I think it's nine books on f football. Is that right? Nine? I might have um, wrong. Yeah, no, you could be right. Could be right. Uh, Quite a lot. I'm kind of looking around me. There's a few. Yeah, there's a few. You know, so I've I've always said, um, to, I've said to a few people on the show, um, like talking about or writing about football or just you know something that you genuinely love or enjoy doing or enjoy watching is kind of like the dream job. Um, I've always thought that. Um, and like I get like a like, like a small kind of taste of it where I obviously doing podcasting now. I, I every Monday myself and Andy we talk about football from the weekend, and it's like mm. there's not many things that I enjoy more than talking, you know, talking football, reviewing the games with Andy, and we've got people. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like great. it's not people calling in necessarily; it's people in the you know in the live chats now. But it's effectively the same thing. Um, and that's kind of like a it's like a dream for me, really, which is I've kind of stumbled upon. But anyway, it's not about yeah. me. Um, I was interested in the book. You wrote um, a book about the, the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. Yeah, um, which nobody in this country will ever have seen. It was actually, um, it was for, I wrote the book for the local organising committee uh, in South Africa. All right. The okay. idea, it was basically, it was a legacy book. And basically, you know, because all his, I don't really sit down and write books like people imagine you write, you've got a blank page. You know, all of my books are just giving other people's voices, but giving, you know, whether it's ghosting an autobiography for someone or it's collecting stories together. And that's what um, that book, uh, 2010, when the World Cup came to South Africa, I went out. I was out um, the year before when the um, Confederations Cup was being played. I'd never been to South Africa, but I, I got asked out there because the, my previous book, um, 
which was called, um, which is a book about football and childhood around the world with a lot of kind of, a lot of kind of big, big players from 40 different countries, kind of Lionel Messi, uh, 39 others. Um, just talking about their childhoods. Anyway, that book came out in South Africa a year before it came out anywhere else in the world. And so I went to South Africa for the launch of it. And uh, I went to a Confederations Cup game in Pretoria, um, which was, it wasn't even South Africa playing. It was the USA versus Italy. But it was kind of about a day after I'd arrived in South Africa. And it just, I just thought this is, this is, the most important World Cup ever. Um, you know, that historically, socially, politically, culturally, this is the one. This is this is Africa's first World Cup. Do you know what I mean? This is... Yeah, yeah. And so I thought... It's massive, wasn't it? Uh, unbelievable. You know, the football weren't great, but man, what, a, what an event. What an event. And so I kind of... Literally, I went to this one game in the uh, in the Confederations Cup and the whole thing just... South Africa and South Africans just blew me away. And I thought it's important to kind of, it's important that people remember this event, not just in terms of the football, but in terms of the impact it could it had on a country and on a continent. So I kind of spoke to, I, I had, I don't know how I got to know him, but I did. But the guy who ran the, um, local organizer committee, the guy who'd, who'd run the bids for South Africa, a guy called Danny Jordan. Um, I got to know him and I, I talked to him about the idea of the book. Really, the sell for it, Simon, was that what I wanted to do was what I imagined was that in 10 years, for, 10 years afterwards, so now, right now, there'd be kids in South Africa who are in primary school or, you know, starting secondary school and they'd go, man, we had a World Cup. We had a World Cup here, you know, in amongst all everything else that's going on in South Africa, in amongst, the, you know, all the incredible challenges that country had to face and still has to face. They go, we had a World Cup here. What was that like? And the idea was that this book would be the answer to that question. This is what it was like. So basically, yeah. I travelled all over South Africa during the during and after the World Cup, all over the country meeting all sorts of people, you know, everybody from Archbishop Desmond Tutu to fellow from Goldman Sachs to a guy running a hostel in Soweto to old lady who made, you know, was doing goat curry outside the stadium on the day of the game to the guy who's running the police operation to, well, you know, all these different people. Woman who, you know, operated the crane that built Greenpoint Stadium, all of these people and just said to them, look, What's this experience like? What, um, you know, what has been the impact of this tournament on your life? And they're the most amazing stories. And the idea was that obviously this would be a chance for people to have a book that told those stories, you know, so that when a kid asks, what was it like when the World Cup came to South Africa? Or when people who were there at the time want to remember what, what it was like when the World Cup came to South Africa, that book would be there to tell them. Because obviously, you know, FIFA and football, you know, FIFA and broadcasters, and they're not interested in that stuff. Newspapers, no. they're not interested in that stuff. All they're interested in is the football. And to be honest, compared to what that tournament meant to that country and to that continent, the football's irrelevant. The football's yes, just an indeed, yeah. Do you know what I mean? The football's just the occasion. You know what it the impact it had on people all over the country and at every level of society was just, you know, whether it was long lasting or not is a question for other people to answer. But at the time, the impact was enormous. And uh, that book was just trying to capture that really in in the time it was happening. Yeah, and I think that one of the things which sticks out to me about the 2010 World Cup is whenever you would see uh, South African fans, uh, you know, interviewed in the in the pre-match, you know, vignettes and things like this, was the emotion that they would talk about football um, and the emotion that they would talk about 
having the World Cup in their country, how much it meant to them. And it was, it was, absolutely, it was really. You could feel it through the TV set. Um, yeah, and I, and no, you know, and, I meant... and the, the thing is because the football wasn't great, people have sort of forgotten about it. But 2006, the World Cup was in Germany. The South African World Cup was better organised than Germany. It was better organised than Germany. Really? You had all these idiots. No names, no pack drill, but you had all these idiots here who knew nothing and still know nothing, mm -hmm. either about football or about Africa, who were going, oh, it's going to be so dangerous. Oh, you mustn't go, you know, don't blah, 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 blah. Do you know, in the entire tournament, there were six arrests. They said the same about Brazil, though, as well, didn't they? Yeah, about you know what I mean? The, uh, you know, the dangers <laughs> and the... Yeah, but it was... Um, no, it was an amazing, amazing experience. Um, and, and it was an amazing experience for me personally. I met some incredible people and um, it was, you know, a, a quite remarkable country. And it was quite amazing to be there at that time. Do you know what I mean? When there was that excitement and that, um, you know, everybody was just... It was intense. It was great. It was so passionate. It was so proud. It was it was a brilliant, brilliant time. It sounds like um, one of those memories and trips that will stick with you, you know, forever. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, 100 percent. But that, I mean, you know, to be fair, I've, I've been really lucky because I've had a few trips like that. But um, <laughs> but that was, you know, that was a big project. That was a big project. You know, that was. Like I say, traveling all over the country, I was backwards and forwards between the UK and South Africa for five or six months, traveling all over the country, meeting, you know, I, I guess probably did about 70 or 80 interviews. Um, and, um, you know, and then obviously wrote them all up and um, helped advise on pictures and, and what have you. It was, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was one of the great jobs, really. And it was, it was, <laughs> thing that was nice was it was a job that only I could do. Only I could do. Because I was the only person who thought it needed doing. And I just happened to convince the guy who mattered that it yeah. needed doing. Um, and, you know, even within South Africa, there wasn't really, I'm not sure there was really the appetite for it, but I just kind of plugged away until it happened and didn't actually do the deal until about 10 days before the World Cup started. But um, got it done in the end. And um, like I say, it, it's one of those where you think, well, that's great. And it's great because in, it, it's great for me personally because it was my idea. I, yeah. If, if, it hadn't, if I hadn't done it, no one would have done it. I think, I think it's a really good idea. And I tell you what, it's historic as well. It's, um, you know, in years yeah, to come, that will stand the test of time and it will take people back to you know what it was really like at the 2010 well, World Cup, it will take people back, but it will also, you know, I hope, you know, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, um, you, you've never been to South Africa, no, 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 okay. So in Johannesburg, there's um, there's this unbelievable museum called the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg, and um. I remember going there. It's it's very, I mean, it's in, an incredibly powerful thing um, because it just lays out the evidence. It just says this is what apartheid was. It, very non-judgmental. Very, you know, just kind of laying it out. It is it's very. But a thing that really struck me very very powerfully was I was going around the museum on my own, um, but there were kind of groups of. School parties were going round at the same time. This was before I started work on the book. This was the year before when I when I went out the year before. Um, <clears throat> there were school parties going round the museum, <clears throat> and what was what was incredible was you'd look at these school parties, and um, obviously the kids. This was 2010, so all of the kids were what they call what they call in South Africa freeborns, so born free. Right. You know, they, they've right. been born since since uh, the end of apartheid. So there, those kids are going around 
and they're looking at history. They're looking at something from the past. They're looking at something that, you know. But of course, their teachers, a lot of them, were born under apartheid. Yeah. So they're looking at lived experience. So they're looking at an experience that they lived. But they're taking these groups of kids around who are born freeze, for whom it's already history. And that kind of, that's, that, that really kind of made an impression on me that, um, you know, that, that something like that could be experienced in those different ways. And so in, in my mind, you know, that that book was kind of trying to, to work in those two different ways as well in that for people who were in South Africa in 2010, it would remind them of what it was like. But then it would also be for young people who hadn't experienced the World Cup when it happened. It would be like just raw testimony, the the stories in the time, told in the time of what it was like when the World Cup came. It's amazing. I am. Um, it's so. Is that available in the uh, in the no. UK or is no. it? Is it, is it no, literally it, just it South book? Um, I've got a couple of copies here, but other than that, no. Because the thing, the thing is, is that how how um, World Cups work is local organising committees have quite a lot of leeway as regards what they do in their own countries. But if that book was to be published outside South Africa, then FIFA would want percentages. You'd have yeah. to be paying for rights for photos and stuff. It would get really, really complicated. Even the use of the word FIFA, you would have to pay for. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like yeah. a little they, mini state. They FIFA. want to cut them everything. But inside South Africa, inside the country, we had quite a lot of freedom to do what we wanted to do. So that was no, fine for me because I didn't really, it, it wasn't particularly, it didn't particularly bother me telling the story for people outside South Africa. I felt it, what was important was that the story got told for South Africa. Yeah, and for absolutely. South Africa. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, earlier on you mentioned um, you'd done some ghostwriting. Um, in particular, yeah. I noticed you've done, you ghost mm. writ, uh, ghost wrote uh, David Beckham's autobiography, which is, you know, I found that really interesting. But just before we go into that, would you be able to just explain for uh, maybe me and you know any of my viewers uh, who don't know what ghostwriting entails? Well, ghostwriting really is just um, helping people to get a story that's in their head down on paper. Okay. So it's really someone who, who has got a story to tell but wouldn't necessarily have the time or the energy or the necessary skill set to put it down on paper right okay so got you. i have those things okay cool so i do that so you wrote uh you ghost wrote uh david beckham's autobiography my side um yeah which won a special prize at the british book awards in uh i think it was sorry, i haven't got the date sorry um but i mean you know obviously david beckham's one of the, of the it got a prize for selling a lot of copies yeah <laughs> He's one of the big, yeah. well, you know, David Beckham's one of the, the best English footballers of all time, one of the biggest names in uh, in football of all time. Um, yeah, I mean, it only took the story up to 2004, to be fair. We finished the, the hardback finished with him joining Real Madrid and the paperback finished with the 2004 European Championships in Portugal. Um True. Was it 2004 when he got sent off? No, it was, no, I think no, it was 98, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 So did you, did you, uh, did you work with, uh, with David to do that? Well, yeah. You know, yeah like, yeah. but what I mean is, um, was it like kind of emails going back and forth or was it no, 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 sit no, down no. and sit down no, and he would down, talk sitting through. down or talking on the phone or no no it was you know you can't do Amazing. that stuff anymore. that must have been <laughs> a uh you know a, a really good experience obviously especially yeah, with, yeah. you know in hindsight as well uh, yeah, again, yeah no, historical isn't it yeah i guess um yeah i guess 
Um, it, it's um, no, I mean, I, it's a very interesting process. I, I like the process. Um, the last one I did was um, I'm actually working on a, 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 a ghostwriting project at the moment, but um, last year I published the um, autobiography of a guy called Andy Woodward, who was okay. the first guy to um, go public about child sex abuse in football um, right, right. in the Guardian in 2016. It was his life story. And, you know, that, well, that really is kind of historic stuff, really. Yeah. And the, the book was, you know, it's his whole life. It's not just the story of uh, what happened to him with Barry Burnell, but it's how that has affected the rest of his life. And, you know, it's a really good, but I, I, I you know, I do, I enjoy that process, that um, the ghostwriting process. I, I enjoy that a lot. And, um, Particularly if the stories are interesting, you know, obviously David's story is very interesting. So too Andy Woodward's in completely different mm. ways. You know I mean? Yeah, it's a big job as well, I suppose, isn't it? It's, 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 it's helping people to tell their story. So you want to get it, you know, you want to get it spot on and help them get uh, stories or memories from their, yeah, the, the, the from point their minds to the paper. To make sure that at the end of it, they feel like it's theirs. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, you've uh, you've done a lot of uh, you know media work as we discussed. Um, you did uh, some some radio work uh, with the BBC's Fight and Talk, BBC Radio Five Live. I think yeah, it was, was wasn't it? Minor, really. I, I did um, I did um, I did seven shows a week for three or four years for Talk Sport. I was going to say, yeah, it's all sport as well. I don't know how I got away with it as long as I did, really. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I did that and, and then did quite a lot of work for um, for the BBC, for Five Live and for um, uh, quite a bit for Radio 4 as well. Um, not all to do with football, really. Um, but, um, but, yeah, Fighting Talk was kind of just, I mean, Fighting Talk was now and again. kind of, yeah, yeah, it was just... Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so are you uh, like a, a box, boxing fan? Uh, no, I'm a fan of quite a lot of boxers. I've, I've, you know, I've been lucky enough to know quite a few boxers over the years and play football with quite a few boxers, but I wouldn't say I'm a fan of boxing, if you know what I mean. I, yeah, okay. I got you. It's not really for me, but boxers are definitely for me. They're some of the, you know, some of the really amazing, I've met some of really amazing, you know, people like Duke McKenzie and, Gary Mason, God rest his soul, and Michael Watson and people like that, you know, really made a real kind of impact on me as human beings. But I'd never go and watch them fight. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, there was something else I was going to ask you about as well. Oh, yeah, you uh, you did um, – you also uh, – you were hosting a Monday night uh, football fans forum on Arsenal TV for a while. Oh, uh, for ages, that's... yeah, yeah, we used to do that. That was more when, um, more when they kind of thought. I think Arsenal thought about, um, well, not just Arsenal. I think everybody had in mind, you know, and some of them are still going, like Liverpool and Man United, and um, they're still kind of running kind of TV channels. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I think yeah, then yeah. Arsenal and quite a lot of other clubs have sort of moved away really from television formats and have gone more for kind of social social media and yeah like internet short form, and short form stuff yeah and to be honest you know uh, with broadcasting generally <clears throat> simon you know not to put too fine a point there i'm just a bit i'm a bit old for all that really yeah okay well, I, don't I, 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 do, I don't know whether I, I think personally i always think that i'd rather uh, i'd rather watch people and listen to people who are charismatic or interesting than listen to someone just because they're of a certain age um well but yeah that's just, yeah, that's, that's just that my personal of, taste there's plenty of very charismatic and interesting young people so and i think that they yeah. you know i think that the drive is always to it's like <clears throat> you know you the, the drive is always to refresh an audience and um you know, some do it more successfully than others. Obviously, I think, you know, Arsenal in some ways have, have done it reasonably successful. Su successfully, they've got one or two kind of quite good people working on board. And you think, oh, yeah, then others, 
in um, talking in respect to football, you know, others haven't done so great. Like Radio 5 have made a complete pig's ear of it. So, you know, but you do need to find ways to refresh your audience. Refresh your lineup, yes, yeah. I think um, yeah. this vital, well, isn't it, to, to keep... Well, the lineup so much. No, no, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, um, you know, getting people who've got followings on social media who perhaps have YouTube channels, who have podcast channels like yourself, whoever, is, you know, myself, I don't think nicking people off Radio 1 is a great way to move football forward on radio. No. But there are there are other ways to do it. And and so that's fine. And it's like, um, you know, I listen, obviously I listen to some <clears throat> sports radio, whether that's Five Live or Talk Sport or whatever. And, I, you know, I, I watch uh, television and um, stuff online and, and what have you. And I'll be honest with you, Simon, I look and I listen and I think, well, that's that's great. Like if that's what people want, they probably don't need me. Mm. Fair enough. Because what right. they do ain't what I do. So that's yes. and obviously that's fine. That's that's um, that's you know you can't go. Oh well, you should do it like I want to do it. Obviously you, you don't do it. That's not how it works. Um, you know you get the chance now instead with maybe with some documentaries around football to sort of do it the way you think it should be done. But as far as broadcasting is concerned, that's that's kind of, I think that ship has sailed, as they say. So, yeah, just to kind of finish off, um, obviously you you make documentaries. You've Like you mentioned, you um, you just finished one off, but just before the lockdown started. Um, are they all for, for BT Sport or is it uh, no, sort of far, far no. and wide? No, I, I had a kind of run of doing doing them for uh, BT Sport. I think they've now got, BT have now got a kind of different team, I think, very different team working on documentaries. Um, but for three or four years, you know, I, I kind of worked on probably 10 or a dozen documentaries with BT, which were, you know, on very different subjects. And I would work on them in very different ways. Some of them I was presenting the camera, others I was writing script for, Others I was producing, other others I was doing research for, or just doing interviews for. So that was a, a that was a real good kind of grounding in, in documentary making. Now I've done uh, for other people as well, but um, but I, you know that's uh, I had a, a kind of run on that really with with BT. Okay, so all the are all the documentaries you've made football based or are they a bit have you done no, some no, other subjects yeah, pretty, well, no they are pretty well the ones that i've made yeah do tend to be football yeah i mean i've worked on one or two that weren't so football football based but no football is um you know i, I think i've got i've got something to offer there where probably other other areas i wouldn't have so much to offer both in terms of kind of knowledge, but also in terms of contacts and <coughs> knowing who's the right person to talk to about uh, something in particular or knowing where to go to capture footage of something. You know what I mean? It's, um, uh, but, uh, but no, it's a good process, that, you know, that whole process. And I do do some work. Uh, there is uh, one particular guy I do some work for who makes documentaries which are nothing to do with football. They're like true crime documentaries. And I do uh, do some work for him. Uh, but that's very specific to do with shaping his stories. You know, okay. he goes, and he, he raises the money. He's got the people to talk to. He's got the, you know, all of that. All he needs is a bit of help working out how it's all going to make sense as a story. Um, and got I'll, you. Yeah. I see. That's cool. Though. That's it. it. Must be quite interesting as well. Mm, it's all interesting. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, I've got one more question for you, um, if you don't sure. mind, and then I'll leave you go. Um, and uh, uh, Andy, uh, who I do the football shows, yeah, he, he wanted me to ask you this because we've been debating for about the last. It feels like forever. Um, almost every Monday with the people in the live chat and stuff about what to do with the football season now. Uh, you know, should it be null and void? Should they end it now and just give everyone the places they're in? 
or should they still be playing it in September when the lockdown, you know, wave the lockdown ever gets uh, stopped? What do you think they should do with the, you know, the Premier League season, the Championship season, the the football season? Um. Well, first of all, I think um, should and there's a big difference probably between what should happen and what will happen. Yes. Um, I'll be honest with you. Uh, the Premier League, most of the championship, European competition, and do what I want. Don't really care. Yeah. No, I'm not really bothered. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, the whole yeah, thing, the whole thing's just a kind of ongoing soap opera now. Do you know what I mean? Is yes, that, it is. They can run one season into the next, and you know, they're all, <clears throat> you know, all the clubs are owned by people with more money than they'll ever be able to spend. So you go, what? What's the? You know, who cares? What bothers me is what happens to probably fifty the 50 clubs that actually make football in this country unique. Um, you know, everybody's got a top division. <clears throat> and in many respects, the top division here has more in common with top divisions in other countries than it has in common with the lower divisions in this country. They exist in different, in parallel universes. Um, but what I've always thought is... Uh, unique about English football is actually that we have just in England never mind Scotland just in England we have over a hundred full-time professional clubs you look at countries like Spain France Italy Germany you know once you get past the top two divisions you're talking about semi-pro once you get past the top three divisions you're talking about amateur Yes, We have over 100 professional clubs. There's a reason for that. And it's not because there's 100 brilliant football clubs. What there is, is there's 100 clubs that really matter to the communities they're in. That's why. And 50 of those clubs, I would think, as we speak, are in genuine danger of going to the wall. Yep. Um, because... The clubs at the top would actually quite happily wave them goodbye. They don't care. Not bothered. Absolutely not bothered. You know, you look at the people who run Premier League clubs. Got no interest whatsoever in the rest of English football. All they're interested in is making sure they keep a bigger slice of the cake. So it seems to me, my thinking is that... Um, <clears throat> The worst possible outcome for those 50 clubs is probably playing out the rest of this season behind closed doors and then somehow or other trying to hurry into another season. Behind closed doors for, you know, the Premier League, top half of the Championship, I would think that would be okay because... Yes you know, huge proportion of their income comes from broadcasting anyway. So, like always, you know, Premier League clubs, increasingly, they're not really bothered about people who go and pay and watch the game. No, no, no. They feel they're, they're, they're beholden to the broadcasters. They're, they feel duty-bound to respect their, their contracts with broadcasters. So that's fine. If they had to play games behind closed doors, that's fine. They wouldn't have to pay anything back on their contracts and okay there wouldn't be any people in the ground they lose a bit of income or in Arsenal's case about three million quid uh, a game but you know they would they would miss out on income at games but they'd be fine because they get the broadcast money which is the big the big chunk so they won't be bothered take league one league two clubs in league one and league two just try and get your head around the idea of them playing games behind closed doors, what that would mean. So those clubs are, by and large, reliant on income uh, from gate receipts. 
So if you were playing games behind closed doors, not only would you be having to pay the players to play in games where you couldn't charge anybody to watch, but because those games were being played, you would have to refund all the people who've already paid to watch them. Yep. And that you'd have made to pay. Shit Creek without a paddle. Absolutely. That's, yeah. And you would obviously have to pay staff and, you know. Mm. So it would cost, it would all be outgoings. To play football behind closed doors in League One, League Two, National League, whenever, would be all outgoings with no income, which is, you know, you don't need to kind of subscribe to The Economist to know that means you're bollocks, you're finished. Oh, yeah, you you're doing ca catastrophic, wouldn't it? You're done. So it seems to me that it seems to me that for those clubs, I, you know, because the reality of the situation is that I think it's pretty unlikely. And in fact, funny enough, the guy, the president of the Bundesliga has said as much a um, couple of days ago. And that's in a country, by the way, that knows how to deal with coronavirus, not like us. No. He said he doesn't think that there'll be people going to football matches this year in 2020. I, I think I agree. So if that's the case, what do you do? Really, what do you do? I don't know what you do. I don't know what you do. I think that... Um, I think that the Premier League and probably the Championship or definitely the half the half of the championship that likes to think of itself as Premier League 2, that thinks it should be in the Premier League, that thinks it's got some... Um, they will probably push quite hard for games to start behind closed doors as soon as possible. <clears throat> Where that leaves Leagues 1 and 2, I don't like to think, really, because, I mean, obvi the obvious thing <clears throat> would be OK, we're going to play behind closed doors. You need to play behind closed doors as well. But we recognise the situation that puts you in. And so we will therefore underwrite. We will make sure that playing football behind closed doors doesn't finish you off as businesses and as football clubs at the hearts of your communities. Um, well, if that happened, then great. I'm not sure I can see that happening. I was going to say right, that would, I think, I think on, you know, that would that would want to. You'd be talking about reversing probably thirty years of football history. You'd be talking about people suddenly realizing and valuing something that, as far as they concerned, were concerned, has had no value for the last thirty years. I don't know. I don't, I I'm not sure I can see that happening. OK, there's, you know, there's a certain amount of money coming from the Premier League um, right now. 125 million, I think. However long that lasts. Um, for my money, that's already owed to clubs in League One and Two who have had their capacity for developing young players completely ruined by E Triple P. Um, you know, I just, I, I'm not sure that the game as a whole um, values clubs outside the top 30 or maybe 40 in this country. And that uh, actually they would kind of, you know, they would look at this as, a, as an opportunity to, to get rid of what they call dead weight. And uh, yeah. so that worries me, really, because for me, those clubs that I'm talking about, those lower league clubs that I'm talking about are actually where the life of the thing is, where what really counts with football is. That's where that lives. And, uh, you know, you know, everybody knows what it meant to bury, to lose their football club. 
I mean, if you're suddenly looking at losing 50 clubs like that, well, then you're talking about English football never being the same again. And you're talking about English football being the poorer in a way that people can only imagine. Because like I say, I think that, you know, what's really unique about English football is is how deep it goes. And, uh, you know, what's unique about English football is not Pep Guardiola, is not Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, is not Harry Kane, it's not... So what? So what? You know, there's good players. There's always good players. It's not about, you know, there's always good managers. It's not about them. That's not what's unique. What's unique is, you know, what's unique is it's Plymouth Argyle, is Cheltenham Town, is, you know, is Barnet, is Solly Old Moors, is, you know, Fleetwood Town, it, you know, that's what's unique. That's what makes football in this country special. You go anywhere, anywhere, you tip up, middle of nowhere. Oh, my God, there's a professional football club here that matters to 3,000 people or 8,000 people or 10,000 people. That's, that's something extraordinary as far as I'm concerned. The fact that Several million people around the world are interested in Manchester United or interested in Arsenal is of no interest to me whatsoever. It's not. Yeah. So what? So what? They're interested in Disney films. Hmm. You know what I mean? They're interested in WWE. Interested in McDonald's. So what? Yeah. So that's what worries me. Well, I tell you what. Tom, that was beautifully and passionately put. And um, I was going to make a couple of points of my own. However, I've decided that because you put it so well, so passionately. And because it's half nine. Well, that as well. But no, <laughs> no, but, also, but more so, I agree 150% with you. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I will just say to everyone, thank you for watching and uh, thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Ace Podcast Nation. You can check out our other episodes of My Story with former England cricketer Chris Lewis, former Wales international Reese Weston and former WBO world champion Robbie Regan up there, as well as all our other series. And you can obviously check out our live show every Monday, 7.30 to talk football which is the andy campbell championship show and uh, tom thank you ever so much for joining me and thank you so much for your time i really really thank appreciate you. it thank you, my friend. you look after yourself yeah and you my friend cheers <laughs>